I think that I was fortunate enough to be able, with some thousands of trade unionists, predominantly but far from exclusively Catholic, to play some part in the defeat of communist union power in the late 40s and early 50s. By accident, I was unable to play some part in the organization of the DLP. He was able to provide them with a tremendous framework uh, that gave a cause and purpose to hundreds and hundreds of disgruntled, grumbling ex-Irish. And I'm quite convinced that if my name had not happened to be Santa Maria, with its magnificent connotations of uh, uh, Italian background, Catholic background, so excellently suited to the revival of a sectarian campaign in Australia. But if it had been Smith or James, I don't think that Dr. Evatt would ever have succeeded in 1954-55. So probably my name was much more significant than my person. But in reality, I have never had any grand design. And I think that I was a completely accidental character in the history of the time. <laughs> My parents were both Italian. They came from a very small group of islands north of Sicily, the Aeolian Islands, near Stromboli. Um, they came from communities which were very primitive, but in which family values, religious values, were very strong indeed. And it would be foolish for me to say that I don't take those values into private and in public life, especially as I believe in them quite independently. He had an enormous influence, and I think it was an influence that was based upon his capacity to bring these undercurrent forces together, that he provided an enemy to a resentful group just at a time when perhaps they were hungriest for an enemy. And of course, the one he provided was communism. I always believed that the only way to fight communism and the union movement was to go in, create a counterforce of anti-communist unionists, organize as well as they did, better than they did and beat them and throw them out. He's got a good leadership personality. I think he was able to swing huge numbers of people in behind him. God knows if he'd gone into secular politics, we might have had a real demagogue. I've never been interested in being in Parliament, um, which I regard very largely as a waste of time. The critical areas of political decision in this country are um, the banking and financial sector, the union sector, the bureaucracy, the universities. Parliament and governments simply seem to me to register decisions that have been made outside. So parliamentary life was never of very much appeal to me. But I was interested in objectives that could only be obtained through legis legislative and administrative change. And uh, I think that the social policies of the movement, which I have described elsewhere, were those objectives. The movement um, was an organisation, largely but not exclusively of Catholics, which was formed roughly in the year 1941, 42, 43. Um, its purpose and meaning must be seen in the context of the general communist problem of the day. Um, the communist problem of the day was a problem created largely through the penetration of the Communist Party into the trade union movement and to the use of that trade union power to break back productive possibilities in the basic industries in this country.
Australia faces the greatest industrial upheaval in a decade as members of the Waterside Workers' Federation go out on strike, demanding pay increases and improved working. Throughout the nation, ports are idle and cargoes lie unattended on walls. Normally a scene of urgent activity, railheads are silent and deserted. Wharfies' pay centres are closed, and if they remain so, other dependent trades must follow suit. Hundreds of thousands could be jobless. Strong action by the federal government is being considered, whilst the men prepare for a long and bitter strike. A strike which threatens Australia's entire economic structure. The Communist Party of Australia was pursuing a policy identical with that of the Communist Party in every Western European country, fulfilling the objectives of Soviet foreign policy, which was to prevent the post-war reconstruction of the West. The lever of power was the trade unions, which they penetrated, and the influence of those unions was on the particular industries which lay at the foundation of the national economy. At Parliament House, Queensland, the Labour government passed an emergency act prohibiting the carrying of offensive banners in industrial disputes. Despite the law, banners appeared en masse, carried by professional demonstrators. Some unionists were obliged to picket to receive strike pay. As demonstrators defy the law, police take action. Summoned to court was Watersiders Secretary Conrad Englart in shorts. The offenders are represented by Communist barrister Max Julius at Wright. Queensland Communist MLA Patterson is prominent in the demonstrations. Police again arrest Englart in a campaign against the laws of the state. The only way of dealing with the communist problem was to create a counterforce of trade unionists who would go into the union movement, of which they were already members, and using the constitutional processes of unionism to try to beat the power of the communist cells. Unfortunately, in my judgment, very many or most of the other denominations other than the Catholic denomination had very few trade unionist members. They rather were drawn from the lower and upper middle classes. But the Catholic population was largely of Irish origin, working class, trade unionist, and fundamentally anti-communist because of the record of communism in relation to their church in Europe. So it was at least possible to build a working class trade unionist resistance to communist penetration among the Catholic community. And this was what the movement was. The thing that I have always had difficulty in comprehending is how a great Irish Australian in many ways an Irishman to the fingertips, like Daniel Mannix, would hand such a wealth of power over to a person who had absolutely no concept of the Irish tradition. They uh, had been living under an oppressive establishment for hundreds of years. When they came to Australia, they found that that same establishment was still here and it was very easy for them to resent it. And I think a very important part of Australian Catholic history is the Catholic ghetto mentality and the paranoia that they felt that they were being oppressed, the oppression was continuing. Therefore, if they couldn't get a job, it was because someone had deprived them of it or someone was putting the boots in somewhere. Uh, this uh, uh, paranoia, in the first place, and the sense of an enemy. Now, the enemy persisted, I think, right up into the 1940s. Uh, if, they, if there was no obvious enemy there, I think they would have had to invent one. It was public knowledge uh, that uh, communism was winning all the way around the world, and that without firing a shot. There's a Catholic organization which was set up in 1941, I understand, to fight communists in the Australian Labour Party, uh, in the trade unions, which I'll call the movement. Now, was the idea of the movement originally yours? 
and I don't claim that it was originally mine, but wherever it originated, I was in favor of it anyway. As in Australia, the labor unions are very important. They really control the Labour Party. They may be in opposition now, but next day they may be in power. And in Australia, therefore, the activities of communism are extremely important because they were so successful in winning to their cause the labor unions. And by winning the labor unions, they were on the way to winning the Australian government sometime. Would you like to say, Archbishop, whose idea it was to, to form this organization we call the movement originally? I understood, I did understand it might have been your idea, but it may have been someone else's. Well, my own idea is that the conception really came, first of all, from Mr. Santa Maria and those who were associated with him. And you supported this? And I supported it with all the help that I could give. Now, what are your relations with Mr. Santa Maria? Well, it's friendly on my part. I don't know what he thinks, but on my side, they're very friendly. And I regard him as, well, the saviour of Australia. One of the criticisms made of this movement was that so few people knew of its existence um, in 1941 when it began. In fact, it didn't, people didn't really know about it, and it wasn't really written about publicly in the press uh, until about 12 years later when Dr. Rabbit attacked it. Uh, and his statement, as you know, your grace caused one of the biggest explosions in Australian politics and led up to the formation of the industrial groups and which led then to the formation of the Democratic Labour Party. Now, what I want to ask you is this. Was the idea of the movement originally conceived as a kind of secret organization? So far as I know, there was no secrecy about it. If you are going to um, win back control of key unions, you could hardly broadcast a day-to-day -day description of what you're up to. Uh, I mean, that would be foolish. Uh, even, I think, the Communists would have seen that as rather a ridiculous position to adopt. Uh, so, because the essential work that had to be done had to remain in a semi-secret uh, semi form, uh, the cloak and dagger aspect of it developed from that. Because, you see, apart from anything else, when you're involved in that type of work, you are going to attract certain people who love cloak and dagger stuff. And they feed off it and thrive in it. And that's essentially, I think, what happened in a number of instances. Uh, uh, the wrong people were attracted because they, uh, they liked that type of life. He made a tremendous appeal to various youngsters, some of whom I knew, with his uh, secretive approach to things. He was a natural-born plotter. And I knew many young people when I was, I suppose, partly of that generation myself, but let's say in the 1930s, who rejoiced in the underground movement, the, uh, the, the secrecy of it. The, uh, it was exciting, it was great fun, and they used to gather together at lunchtime and, uh, and talk about this as if it was a major campaign of some sort. And uh, I think there is uh, something, um, something continental about Santa Maria like that. 
Uh, his uh, people have often used the word mafia in connection with him. Well, I'm not going to associate him, obviously, you know, with murder and that kind of skullduggery. That would be ridiculous. He's a very honourable, peace, actually peace-loving guy. But I, I think he does have a preference for doing things in the dark. You had to sort of develop uh, a system, a, a mechanism, which was not dissimilar from the very way the communists themselves had captured those unions in the first place and the type of Carter operation that went with it. But in my judgment, the movement had the most progressive social policy then proposed to uh, the labour movement and to the working people in Australia. Um, it, was, um, uh, it, it was completely decentralist in its outlook. Uh, we believe that hyper-centralisation, the metropolitanisation of the Australian population, would lead to enormous social problems in this country. And therefore the centre of the movement's social programme was decentralism. Not merely geographic decentralism, but decentralisation of ownership, of the control of industry. Um, that, we thought, with, um, and a paradigm case for us, was the development of industry in towns like Orange in New South Wales, where I think today there are something like a hundred industries making possible for very many people who live in that city um, a balanced rural urban life. There was growing unrest amongst a number of Labor people, both Catholic and non-Catholic, as to the activities of the movement itself uh, within the party. And this was also being transmitted to the bishops uh, on the basis that some of them were also fearful that uh, they might, might uh, eventually, in the Catholic sense, uh, uh, win a battle but lose the war. So they started to take a much closer look at the extent and the power of the movement and uh, they started to become concerned about the fact that they themselves weren't having sufficient influence in the activities of the movement to tone down its activities. The movement, as I have always insisted, and I think I'm in a position to insist because I was one of the only three present when the movement was formed in 1941, was not an organisation which was formed by the Catholic bishops or was ever to be controlled by them. It was formed by a small group of Catholic trade unionists who wanted to fight the battle against communist power in the union movement. And all that they wanted was the assistance of the bishops so long as the bishops thought it worthwhile to give that assistance. The other viewpoint which developed in 1954-55 at the time of the Labour split, when I have no doubt at all that Dr Ebert and uh, anti-industrial group leaders like Mr Doherty of the AWU uh, endeavoured to frighten Cardinal Gilroy with the awful possibilities of what a split would mean in the revival of sectarianism in Australia. The other viewpoint which was then put with some passion by uh, Cardinal Gilroy, his auxiliary bishop Carroll in Sydney, was that in the last analysis the bishops had the right to control the movement. Now, if Cardinal Gilroy was supporting one position, Dr Mannix was supporting the other. That led to uh, sort of a, a polemical position or positions and uh, arising from that was the great Santa Maria Treatise, which said, look, the bishops can't dictate the terms here. This is essentially a labour. And he got total support in that point of view from Dr Mannix. Now, on the other hand, uh, um, Cardinal Gilroy said, no, this is essentially a work of, of the lay people under the control of the, of the bishops. And... Uh, we'll get a, a ruling on that from Rome. Now, in the event uh, the Roman ruling was uh, all things to all men, and uh, it left uh, the bishops in control of what was essentially a Catholic action story, but the Santa Maria laity type person in control of a body which changed its name but continued to do exactly the same things as the old movement did.
communism, the evil force that enslaves one-third of the world's population, is moving perilously close to Australia. If you vote ALP, you are voting for a party that works with and helps communists. The communist influence in the ALP today is frightening. And if the ALP wins this election, our very freedom is in danger. The way to stop communism, the way to keep Australia free, is to vote Democratic Labour, the party sworn to stamp out communism. Australia needs a genuine Labour Party today more than ever before. A Labour Party dedicated to preserve our security and welfare. And that party is the Democratic Labour Party. Vote one, DLP. The Democratic Labour Party came into existence after the Labour split in 1954-55. Um, it was never intended to come into existence. It was in fact an accident of the times. The view which uh, a number of my colleagues and myself had at the time of the Labour split was quite simple, and I simply hold to it today, that when Evert launched his attack on the industrial groups and the movement on the 6th of October 1954, I didn't believe that Evert could win. It was unfortunately the split among the Catholic bishops which led the most, but not all, of the Catholic members of the industrial groups in New South Wales to break from their pledged word to the industrial groups in Victoria and Queensland. And it was that that allowed Evert to come through and to expel the industrial group leaders in Victoria and in New South Wales. At that point, of course, the strategy of uniting the three major states against uh, whatever he had in the three minor states was of no avail. He had the federal executive and the federal conference and most of the industrial groupers were expelled. At that stage, of course, the question arose, how can you continue the work which you've been doing? And the only way to do that was to try and force a revision of the, de the decisions of the Hobart Conference. And the only way to do that was to take advantage of the preference vote in Australia by organising a party which ultimately became the DLP, which could marshal its vote and fighting a war of attrition, a guerrilla war, if you like, when you no longer had the big battalions, uh, by the use of the preference vote to stonewall Ebert out of office until the Labour Party was forced to come to terms and to rewrite the decisions of the Hobart Conference. That's why the Democratic Labour Party was formed. But since it was a political party for a certain period, since it had five senators at one stage, it had to develop a political program. And that program already mentioned uh, decentralism, joint participation in industry, agricultural settlement, um, family living wage, a strong defence and foreign policy, a strong uh, recognition of the problem of uh, the power of the Soviet Union. This was the framework of the DLP's public policy. Voting in this election is a little like buying a car. Liberal model, looks flashy, costs a fortune to run. ALP, worn out, falling to pieces, only goes if you push. And we know who's pushing. Wow, there's your best buy, the lively DLP. Make this state a great state, a modern, up-to-date state for the one in the square for the DLP. Oh, I think it played a very significant role over a fair period of time. I think you could say through till about 1972, and the starting point of that story is 1955, 56. So it, that's a pretty significant period of Australian political history. And... Uh, to simply give it to you in, in, in uh, fundamental terms, it kept a Liberal government in power in Canberra over an extraordinarily long period of time. It made Bob Menzies the longest serving Prime Minister in Australia's history. It did keep the Liberals in government for a much longer period than was necessary. But if the Labor Party had been prepared to rewrite the policy of destroying the industrial groups at any time, that could have been changed. In that sense, it was not the DLP which kept the Liberals, out, uh, the Liberals in office. It was the refusal of the Labor Party to assume uh, that aspect of its program, the anti-communist aspect of its program, which had always been part of its tradition and uh, prior to ever splitting the party. There was a period where I think the emergence of the DLP was like the emergence of similar parties in Europe, these Catholic centre party type operations and uh, that meant that um, uh, what uh, the movement was doing 
essentially, was, was importing something that was understood in Catholic philosophical terms in Europe, but was essentially a, an ailing philosophy to a country like Australia. But the, uh, the European influence uh, certainly emerged via that, that, that route. But as time went on, the church itself changed its demeanour, and I think the uh, Second Vatican Council was the vital factor in that. Uh, there was a breaking down of the hard line. The immense changes which have been made in uh, the Catholic liturgy, in uh, Catholic catechetical or religious instruction and so on, in Catholic seminary training, I regard as enormous sources of the weakening of Catholic influence in the world and of um, Catholic influence with even among its own people. His role has become one of issue politics and moving away from that fundamental area that was the very birth of the movement itself, namely the industrial fight and the political connection. Yes, I believe um, there is no doubt at all that in the 30s and 40s and to some extent in the 50s, among the, um, uh, the determining influences in Australian life, that minority of people who really determine events, there is no doubt at all that the greatest challenge to what I may call established order, although I don't like the phrase, was Marxism. But I believe that Marxism has been completely bypassed by nihilism, and in fact Marxism is no well, longer an ideology that we need worry about, one. simply because it makes no more converts. Four. But nihilism makes converts even among people who don't know the word nihilism. <laughs> Here now is Point of View, an independent news commentary by Mr. Bob Santamaria on behalf of the National Civic Council. It's the permissibility of everything that underlies the disintegration of modern civilization. It underlies the revolution in sexual ethics. It underlies the disintegration of the modern economic system. So you must identify the areas of um, struggle, as it were, to use a Marxist phrase, and go into battle in each one of them. It's very difficult to know him as a private individual. I've known him since, I would say, 1936, 37. Uh, I've known very little of his private life, and he's admitted me to none of it. Uh, more than that, I think we've had a lot of friends in common of the same generation, and I think the same thing could apply to them. Santa Maria's private life is very private. I don't know if he has intimate friends. I don't know any of them, and I've never been one. Uh, now, whether this is a defensive thing or not, I don't know. But I think that's why there has always tended to be a division between people who were originally close, even boyhood friends, and those people as they grew up. Australia in the 1950s still seemed to me to respond to the characteristic stimuli, to the characteristic principles, if you like, which I tried to suggest at the very beginning. Family was important. Religion was still important. Patriotism was not at a discount. Um, small institutions, small business, uh, whether it was um, generally practiced or not, was still regarded as the norm in this country. I find that those values have been largely bypassed and must be re-won. And I have very little doubt that if we stick at it, they can be re-won. Uh, there are some people um, associated with university life in Australia who say that um, those with whom I am associated in the NCC are doomed to ultimate failure because we won't come to terms with modernity. All that I can say is that they can have modernity. Uh, they can look at the number of broken families. Uh, they can look at the number of uh, slums on the outskirts of Australian metropolitan cities. They can look at uh, the triumph of nihilism in our educational system. And if that's modernity, they're welcome to it. <laughs> 